just I, I kid duty. So box 9.1, uh, the, the title is Enthalpy. Yeah. And, well, we, we know what energy is. We just spent a little bit of time talking about entropy, and this is enthalpy. So I'll just read it out. Defined as the heat content of a substance per unit mass. So uh, we know that energy is measured in joules. Uh, enthalpy, well, just straight from the book, it's, um, it's joules per kilogram. You might also think of it as specific energy. You know, uh, sometimes you hear that, specific energy. Uh, there's two different ways to look at that, and I know we've looked at energy density before. Um, this, though, this is, this is thermal only. This is just thermal energy. It's not chemical energy. So if you remember back when we looked at energy densities for, you know, batteries and hydrogen and gasoline, um, I mean, yeah, that'll turn into heat, but that's more the chemical energy density when it, when it burns and, and combines with oxygen. This is the enthalpy. It's the heat energy density only. So you'll notice when we went back to that, that, those energy density tables, there wasn't like, oh, this is the energy density of a really hot rock. Well, there's another name for that. It's the, it's the enthalpy. Okay. Now, geothermal resources, and so if you ever you know, make it to one of these um, neat conferences, they're going to talk about high enthalpy versus low enthalpy. That's what's mentioned here. If you've got nice high enthalpy, you've got a big temperature gradient, Maybe high enough that you can make steam. If you can make steam, maybe you can make electricity. Uh, with the low enthalpy, you're not going to necessarily be able to make steam. You might be able to make um, vapor from another fluid with a lower boiling point, but in general, the lower enthalpy is going to be for uh, district heating. It also mentions um, temperature and pressure. So obviously, the higher the temperature of a substance, the more heat it has. If you put something under pressure, that will also make it hotter. OK. But as they say here, for the purpose of this chapter, it's, it's usually sufficient to think of temperature and enthalpy as going in hand. We don't normally think of it as being a uh, function of um, pressure. Okay. Uh, the first one that's mentioned, and this, this is starting to happen now in some of these oil wells where they're, where they're getting down into some hotter rocks. Uh, dig down 300 or sorry, 3,000 meters, 700 meters or so, um, send some water down, it comes up in steam, and then you've got uh, the capacity to, to spin a turbine. Uh, it says, by 2010, world electrical power generation capacity from geothermal resources had reached 10 gigawatts. Um, that's about four or five coal strips. You know, it sound, might sound like a lot, Coal strip is big, but it's still a tiny fraction of the 16 terawatts that uh, we consume annually. So 10 gigawatts, it's, it's approximately zero. <laughs> it's four, four orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, it says, now it says by 2015 the world capacity should be at 18.5. Well, it's 2015. Let's look it up. I paid my $3 to Wikipedia today. <laughs> uh, global uh, geothermal capacity. Well, and there's, there's, there's a couple different, um, wait, there's, there's, um, there's capacity, like how much we could be using, like if I went over to 
Jerry Johnson hot spring and took a big pipe and ran it to my house. I mean, it probably freeze before it got there. But, uh, you know, there, there's, the, there's that source there. But what we're looking here is the exploited sources. Let's just see what, um, let's just see what we got here. Flash team, Byron's Idol, 2015. Ooh, 12. Oh, let's see. Ah, we're, we're behind. Yeah, yeah. Well, we fell we fell short from the from the predictions. Maybe our British colleagues were a little overly ambitious. They rounded up. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're optimists, you know. Um, now, here, here's something to mention, though, and you could even you could even look at this in the your summary four. International markets grew at an average annual rate of five percent over the past three years. Um, now, these guys are saying, uh, well, whoever is saying this, Citation 3 says we might hit uh, 15 to 18 gigawatts by 2020. Um, and here we go. Only 6% has been tapped. Um, we might be able to hit uh, 2 terawatts. Of, of power, of, 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 and that's a that's a reasonable chunk. That, that's a big old chunk of our of our. No, that's just the total range. The, these authors here on Wikipedia are saying we might hit 18 gigawatts by 2020, but if we use all of the Earth's resources, um, we we might be able to get as high as, as two terawatts. Um, Iceland, Philippines. Kenya, I didn't know that about Kenya, uh, and El Salvador as well. And this is this is making um, making electricity. Pretty cool. So and and also, if, if you read something like five percent per year, and you're an investor, and you've got uh, financial rates at at point five, and there's some money right there. So this is only going to get uh, only going to get bigger. All right. Now, if we look at um, table. 9.1. I'm just going to go right down to Kenya, and it looks like um, Kenya was at 100, 129 gigawatts. Uh, Japan is not even mentioned, nor is Italy. The, uh, the Philippines certainly are. The Philippines at uh, 2 gigawatts. Uh, the United States, I mean, you don't hear that much about it, but if you look at the U.S., you've got over 25% of the world's total geothermal capacity are already installed. It's, it's very much eclipsed by our other energy, but uh, there it is. Okay. One other thing that comes up on the, the exam for this, for this um, chapter is geothermal, even though it's renewable, it can be exploited or used at an unsustainable rate. I know that's a, that's a question that comes up all the time. And um, I mean, just, just if you think about it from a, uh, a global perspective, you know, we already mentioned like right at the very beginning of the lecture that the Earth st started out hot and it's only getting colder. I mean, of course we hear global warming, climate change, the, at the atmosphere is getting warmer because of greenhouse gases, but the, the core of the planet isn't getting any more energy. It, it, it had whatever kinetic and thermal energy it had when it first formed, and it's only getting colder at that rate of 10 to 21 joules per year, 60 milliwatts per square meter. It's radiating its energy back to space. So you could imagine a very advanced uh, alien civili civilization that was uh, needed heat to keep their spaceship warm and said, oh look, there's a, a, a planet down here with a molten core, we've got a big straw, you know. <laughs> so let's just, so some alien life form comes down and, you know, sucks off our iron core and, and, and flies off of it so they can, you know, keep their tootsies warm for the next thousand years or, or whatever. So the, the whole point is you, you can uh, exploit the Earth's geothermal resources at a, at a unsustainable rate. Now, 
obviously these, these sites that we're looking at here in Iceland and some of the ones we're going to look in the chapter are not tapping the core, obviously. I mean, but you could imagine sort of a pocket of surface heat that you could go through at an unsustainable rate. So just keep that in mind when you're answering that question. All right. Okay, so here's some more technology. Oh, and there's one other little thing there in box 9.2 talking about um, discharge rates. So, you know, a 20 to 1 ratio, 250 to 1 ratio. Those are the same ratios when we were looking at uh, in NRGY 101 when we looked at the um, reserve to extraction rates. Uh, the same thing when we look at world o meters. So th these two figures, this is uh, 9.2, uh, the old geothermal power station at Lardarello, and then they have a spanking new one. And I have, I have not, I've not been there before, and I, I do believe there is a geothermal station in Montana. It might not be a bad field trip one of these days. So they're making electricity, these, these guys. It does mention um, later here in 9.1, it says, meanwhile, schemes making direct use of geothermal heat, and I'm just reading from 417, for district heating and agricultural purposes have advanced. This is where we're going to go. I mean, if, if I know anything, I know that our energy systems are going to become more distrib distributed. When, when, I, when I phoned in with Dane's office last week, um, and then just two days ago on the radio, you hear Patrick Barkey saying, hey, we've got to keep Coal Strip open because there's 7,000 jobs at stake, and a half a billion dollars of the Montana economy at stake, well, coal strip's going to die eventually, either, either by environmental closure or just the technology gets old. Even on this page we're looking at right now, you see the old on the left, the right on the new. Technologies evolve. But what I see us doing is making much better use of our local heat. And one thing I'm going to propose when I go in front of the um, Missoula Federal Credit Union a week from tomorrow, is that we do some district heating in this valley. So all of that hot air, hot sun, hot fire that was hitting us all summer long, store it in a big saltwater tank underground, and then use that instead of you know using these little electric furnaces right now that have coal strip burning for us. So. I know that's going to be the case. And I was even talking with Carl Little about that from NCAT today. He's an agriculturalist and wants to take biomass, use it for local heating just like they do at Hall. So there's going to be a huge trend in that, in that field. Um, okay. And then finally it says there's been a quiet revolution in the use of shallow geothermal energy. This is what Jonathan Bow uses at his house. My parents, when they built their house, had a, um, it's, it's a pretty cool concept. Uh, very simple, I'll just kind of show you what, what they did. Um, this is back in um, Indiana, where land is all shaped square like this. If you've ever flown over the Midwest, you'll know that's the case. <laughs> but. Uh, on, on my parents' property, they had um, a little stream coming in over here and another stream coming in over here. And so what they did, they built a little, uh, a little dam. And so now, as, as a result, they have this kind of neat um, kind of boomerang or, or kidney-shaped lake, right? And so when we were looking at wind earlier in the semester, we talked about, you know, how the 
the air heats and cools at a certain rate, the water heats and cools at a different rate, the, the land it, itself, the, the water mass itself tends, tends to be um, a heat capacitor. So when you're, when you're, doing, your NR, when you're doing your ETEC 106, you've got your capacitors, which are electric capacitors. Well, a lake is a thermal capacitor. It, it stays hot when it's cold, and it stays cold when it's hot. It's always kind of going the, the opposite direction of whatever the temperature is going. That's exactly what um, capacitor is doing. So they um, built their house here. And just out in the middle of the, of the lake, well, they sent some, some tubing out here, um, put a little, a little coil, a little heat exchanger, and this guy is flowing almost year-round. So in, in the summer, you know, and the, the lake's just about, at the bottom of the lake, it's, it's never going to get, um, well, you guys know how, how water works so that the, um, the ice at the top can be way colder than freezing, but water is most dense at 4 degrees Celsius. So it's, it's never going to get colder than 4 degrees Celsius at the bottom of the lake unless the thing freezes solid, which is never going to get quite that cold. So. Um, it could be even be, you know, minus 30 outside. In fact, there were some minus 30 days uh, in Indiana last year, believe it or not. It's kind of, kind of weird. But minus 4 is warmer than minus 30. And so moving, you know, moving that minus 4 um, energy into a situation that's minus 30, you're, you're gaining energy. Another thing to note, and this is back to the whole enthalpy deal, you might have, gosh, let's, let's just say a, a 100 watt uh, pump, you know, doing the circulation. So there's, there's friction in the lines, right? You have to move the fluid through the, uh, through the tubing. So you've got a 100 watt pump. You might get um, 2,000 watts of energy, of enthalpy through the system. So you might have in the, in the form of heat. So this was electricity, but in the form of heat, you might get 2,000 watts coming back. Um, and those 2,000 watts could be heat if, you're, if you've got maybe, uh, let's just say, 50 degree water out in the, in the lake and um, uh, zero degree air back uh, closer to the house, so, you're, so you're, you're, you're bringing that heat up. Or it could be that much cooling power as well. Let's say it's 80 or 90 or 100 outside, but you've got nice 50 degree water. You could be pumping heat away from the house and cold towards it. Now, what, and this is, this is a little bit weird. We've talked about Carnot efficiency back. We've talked about Betts, Betts law, which was also an efficiency metric. Geothermal seems to defy the laws of physics in terms of efficiency, because if I tell you I'm using 100 watts of electricity and I'm getting 1,000 watts of heat, um, efficiency equals power, uh, let's just write it this way, um, power out over power in equals 2,000 over 100 equals 20. And we all know that efficiency has to be between 0 and 1. So it seems to defy the laws of physics. Um, now, it doesn't, because it all depends on where you draw your, your system boundaries. Um, so anyway, that's, that's another quirk that you might see when you, when you see a, a geothermal system rated at 400% efficiency. That's, that's where that comes from. Okay. Um. Oh, and this, it also says right here at the end of, of um, 9.1, it says uh, these, these uh, shallow geothermal systems are particularly valuable when a building requires cooling or air conditioning in summer as well as heating in the winters. They can be designed to reverse the cycle extracting heat from the building and deposit in the ground. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just, let's just do a little bit more and then we'll take a break. I don't want to get...
too far into this. There, there's, some, there's some really cool physics coming up, and if you get a chance, uh, take Jonathan Bowe's course, and he'll um, let you know all about it. Um, this, this looks a lot like uh, the oil diagrams we saw from 101, but instead of um, a hydrocarbon here, you've got your, or natural gas, you've got steam. Uh, so the, conv the con confined aquifer is, you know, more or less water that's um, running deep underground. There's um, a heat source, obviously, as I, as I mentioned, um, a hot hot center of the earth from its very early formation. Um, this, this stuff, I, I'm only now beginning to realize um, when you hear about Arizona pumping the heck out of its aquifer, California pumping its aquifer, a lot of this water has been down there a long time. Uh, I, just, I was just up in Glacier. It was the last day that Logan Pass was open here in, um, well, what was it? A couple, well, whatever it was. Middle, middle, middle of uh, October. And I'm looking at these little glaciers, and I'm like, that is some really old snow. <laughs> I, mean, I know these glaciers sort of cycle, and it's not like, you know, the, like the, the stuff from the bottom comes up to the top eventually, but there's some old freaking snow that is going away for good. It's not coming back. And I, I think the same thing is happening in these aquifers. Like, that water has been down there a long time. And, you know, the, the things that we're looking at right here on the, on the screen are um, natural. I mean, all the, the, the geyser, the fumarole, the hot spring, uh, those are all being sent up naturally. But uh, the, the steam well, you know, some wise guy came along and said, hey, it looks like there's something down there. Let me drill it. Um, so well, I guess what I'm saying is even though they're considered renewable energy resources, they can be overexploited. They, they can be extracted and taken from quick, more quickly than their uh, nature replaces them. Okay. Now, I don't want to get, get too deep into this because there's a little bit of math that I want to cover, but one thing we do want to consider here are um, a couple terms. Um, a couple terms. I don't, I don't know if I put any exams out there on this, but um, there are these two things called um, isotropy. and homogeneity. So homogeneity means that, that the stuff is sort of um, the same everywhere. So if we look, let's just look at this guy. Um, th this is a, a relatively homogeneous mixture because all the particles are about the si same size. This is in homogeneous because they're particles of different sizes. This is also relatively homogeneous, and this is relatively inhomogeneous. Um, now, so I think you, and you, you know, you kind of have a sense of what that means. If you ever bake a cake, you put it in an egg, you put it in a flour, you put it in a milk, before you mix it together, it's inhomogeneous. Once you mix it, everything's everywhere, and it looks the same, then it's homogenized. You've even probably seen homogenized milk. This means they like mix the you know what out of it, so all the fats, you know, are <laughs> stored in there. Now, so that's one that's one way to look at things. It also means it, it looks the same in every direction. The other word that I wrote up here, um, isotropy. So iso means the same, and trope means move, like troops, you know, marching. Uh, and so that means it, it, it's the same in any direction. Well, in this case, and this is actually pretty critical, if you look at this, this uh, formation down here, it's relatively anisotropic. You can see that there are cracks in this direction, 
but not in this direction. And so thinking back here, um, the, 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 the landform itself is anisotropic because you can see the water can move left to right or horizontally, but not up and down quite as easily. So um, anyway, I'll let you think about that a little bit. Isotropy versus homogeneity, it's, it's important in terms of how water flows through systems. You know, it could flow very quickly in one direction, but not at all in the other one. And then the, what we'll cover uh, next time is this thing called Darcy's Law and permeability. Those are the two equations here. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I really enjoyed that lecture a lot. Um, getting, getting close to the end here. Yeah, I love this. I love this textbook. <laughs>